Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series reading The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Without further ado, returning to The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn as read by Lord Naren White. Towards night, it began to darken up and look like rain. The heat was lightning. The heat lightning was squirting around low down in the sky. And the leaves was beginning to shiver. It was going to be pretty ugly. It was easy to see that. So the Duke and the King went to overhauling our wigwam to see what the beds was like. My bed was a straw tick better than Jim's, which was a corn shuck tick. There's always cobs around about in a shuck tick. And they poke into you and hurt. And when you roll over the dry shucks sound like you, was rolling over in a dead pile of in a pile of dead leaves. It makes such a rustling that you wake up. Well, the Duke allowed he would take my bed, but the king allowed he wouldn't. He says I should have reckoned the difference in rank would have suggested to you that a corn shuck bed weren't just fifteen for me to sleep on. Your Grace, they'll take the shuck bed yourself. Jim and me was in a sweat again for a minute, being afraid there was going to be some more trouble amongst them. So we was pretty glad when the Duke says, "'Tis my fate to be always ground into the mire with, under, iron, under the iron heel of oppression." Misfortune has broken my once haughty spirit. I yield, I submit. Tis my fate. I am alone in the world. Let me suffer, can bear it. We got away as soon as it was good and dark. The king told us to stand well out towards the middle of the river and not show a light till we got a long ways below the town. We come in sight of the little bunch of lights by and by. That was the town, you know and slid by about half a mile out, all right. When we was three quarters of a mile below, we hoisted up our signal lantern, and about ten o'clock it come on to rain, blow, and thunder, and lighten like everything. So the king told us both to stay on watch till the weather got better. Then him and the duke crawled into the wigwam and turned it in, turned in for the night. It was my watch below till twelve, but I wouldn't have turned in any way if I'd had a bed, because my body don't see such a storm as that every day in the week, not by a long sight. My souls, how the wind did scream along. And every second or two there'd come a glare that lit up the white caps for a half a mile around, and you'd see the islands looking dusty through the rain and the trees thrashing around in the wind. Then comes a whack! Bum bum, bum balum, bum bum, bum balum, bum bum bum. And the thunder would go rumbling and grumbling away and quit. And then rip comes another flash and another sock dolge. The waves most washed me off the raft sometimes, but I hadn't any clothes on and didn't mind. We didn't have no trouble about snags. The lightning was glaring and flittering around so constant that we could see them plenty soon enough to throw her head this way or that and miss them. I had the middle watch, you know, but I was pretty sleepy by that time, so Jim, he said he would stand the first half of it for me. He was always mighty good that way, Jim was. I crawled into the wigwam, but the king and the duke had their legs sprawled around, so there weren't no show for me. So I laid outside. I didn't mind the rain, because it was warm, and the waves weren't running so high now. About two they come up again, though, and Jim was going to call me, but he changed his mind. Because he reckoned they weren't high enough yet to do any harm. But he was mistaken about that. For pretty soon, all of a sudden, along comes a regular ripper and washed me overboard. It most killed Jim a laughing. He was the easiest black to laugh at that ever was, anyway. 
I took the watch, and Jim, he laid down, and snored away, and by and by the storm let up for good and all, and the first cabin light that showed I rousted him out, and we slid the raft into hiding quarters for the day. The king got out a old ratty deck of cards after breakfast, and him the duke played seven up a while, five cents a game. Then they got tired of it, and allowed they would lay out a campaign, as they called it. The duke went down into his carpet bag, and fetched up a lot of little printed bills and read them aloud. One girl said, The celebrated Dr. Armand de Montalban of Paris would lecture on the science of phrenology at such and such a place, on the blank day of blank at ten cents admission, and furnish charts of character at twenty-five cents apiece. The duke said that was him. In another bill, he was the world-renowned Shakespearean tragedian, Garrick the Younger of Drury Lane, London. In other bills, he had a lot of other names and done other wonderful things, like finding water and gold with a divining rod, dissipating witch spells, and so on. By and by, he says, but the histrionic muse is the darling. Have you ever trod the boards, royalty? No, says the king. You shall then, before you're three days older. Fall in grandeur, says the duke. The first good town we come to, we'll hire a hall and do the sword fight in Richard the Third, and the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet. How does that strike you? I'm in, up to the hub, for anything that will pay bilge water. But you see, I don't know nothing about play acting. I ain't never seen much of it. I was too small when Pap used to have at the palace. Do you reckon you can learn me? Easy. All right. I'm just a freezing for something fresh, anyway. Let's commence right away. So the Duke, he told him all about who Romeo was and who Juliet was, and said he was used to being Romeo, so the king could be Juliet. But if Juliet's such a young gal, Duke, my peeled head and my white whiskers is going to look on uncommon odd on her, maybe. No, you don't worry. These country jakes won't ever think of that. Besides, you know, you'll be in a costume. And that makes all the difference in the world. Juliet's in a balcony, enjoying the moonlight before she goes to bed. And she's got on her nightgown and her ruffled nightcap. Here are the costumes for the parts. He got out two or three curtain calico suits, which he said was medieval armor for Richard III, and the other chap and a long white cotton nightshirt, and a ruffled nightcap to match. The king was satisfied. So the duke got out his book and read the parts over in the most splendid spread eagle way, prancing around and acting at the same time, to show how it had got to be done. Then he gave the book to the king and told him to get his part by heart. There was a little one-horse town about three mile down the bend, and after dinner the duke said he had been ciphered out his idea about how to run in daylight without it being dangerous for Jim. So he allowed he would go down to the town and fix that thing. The king allowed he would go, too, and see if he couldn't strike something. We was out of coffee, so Jim said I better go along with them in the canoe and get some. When we got there, there wasn't nobody stirring, streets empty, and perfectly dead and still like Sunday. We found a sick black sunning himself in a backyard, and said everybody that weren't too young or too sick or too old was gone to camp meeting about two mile back in woods. The king got the directions and allowed he'd go and work the camp meeting for all it was worth. I might go too. The duke said what he was after was a printing office. We found it. A little bit of concern up over a carpenter shop. Carpenters and printers all gone to the meeting and no doors locked. It was a dirty, littered-up place and had ink marks and handbills with the pictures of horses and runaway blacks on them all over the walls. The duke shed his coat and said he was all right now. So me and the king lit out for the camp meeting. We got there in about half an hour fairly dripping, for it was a most awful hot day. There was as much as a thousand people there from twenty mile round. 
The woods was full of teams and wagons hitched everywhere, feeding out of the wagon troughs and stomping to keep off the flies. There was sheds made out of poles and roofed over with branches, where they had lemonade and gingerbread to sell, and piles of watermelons and green corn and such like truck. The preaching was going on under the same kinds of sheds, only they was bigger and held crowds of people. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.